Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. Today I would like to talk about a novel that is very close to me. I am referring to La Colmena or The Hive by the Spanish novelist Camilo José Sela. I have mentioned this novel many times before. I remember mentioning it in the video that I did on Berlin Alexanderplatz, so we are talking about a very long time ago. Also in the video that I did on Midak Ali and the one on Life, a user's manual. So this is a novel that in a sense I have promised you for a very long time. And I think that this is a very good time to talk about it because this has just been released in a new translation by the New York Review Books publisher. So I think it's a good time to uh, approach this novel by Camilo José Sela. Now, above all that, I wanted to let you know that this is a novel that is very close to me in the sense that I would say it's one of the most influential texts at the personal level that I have read. I'm going to tell you why. I have a little confession to make, but first I wanted to look at the information on uh, the novel and also, you know, a little bit at my experience with the work of Camilo José Sela. So I first read La Colmena, or The Hive, many years ago when I was in college. This was my sophomore year in, in college, and I took a class titled Survey of Spanish Literature. It was the second part. So I liked it so much uh, that I continued to buy books by Camilo José Sela. I went to Chicago back uh, in, in that time, and there was a really, really good a bookstore that sold Spanish books and I found his first novel which was tremendously influential La Familia de Pascual Duarte and then a later text that is titled Mrs. Caldwell Habla con su hijo a very experimental novel that I enjoyed very much so I read him you know those were the novels that I read and uh, all of them are very different. If you look at Camilo José Sela's work, he was very prolific and also very different in, in each one of the texts that he uh, presented to us. They all left a very good impression on me, but for some reason to this day I have not read another book by Camilo José Sela. I don't really know why. Years later, after I read those, I found at Half Price Books this first volume of his complete works. And this includes the one that I mentioned before, La Familia de Pascual Duarte, so Pascual Duarte's family, Pabellón de Reposo, which is a novel about people who are in a hospital for uh, those who are suffering from tuberculosis. And then the third one that is included here in this first volume is Nuevas Andanzas y Desventuras de Lazarillo de Tormes, which is basically a sequel that Sela wrote to that great, uh, famous, and timeless, picaresque Spanish novel, El Lazarillo de Tormes. So he took up that uh, great story right there. He has many interesting works, but I would say, and this is what many people will tell you, La Colmena, The Hive, is really his most famous one. And there are many reasons for that. So let me tell you what La Colmena is about. And believe it or not, this question has a very straightforward answer. The Hive is about three days in the lives of people in the Spanish capital of Madrid. Madrid is a beautiful city. I had the opportunity to visit it many years ago. It is a place that I totally see myself living in, right? But if you read The Hive, that is not uh, the picture of Madrid that you are going to see there. It is not a flattering picture that Sela paints at all of Madrid. And why is this? Basically, we're, we are talking about the Madrid of the 1940s, okay? So, the Madrid of the years right after the Spanish Civil War, which, as you may know, was fought between 1936 and 1939. There is one historical event towards the end of the novel that tells us exactly what year the action takes place, and that is 1943. In terms of characters, what do we have here? And I think the obvious thing to say, the first thing to say, is that the main character of the hive is Madrid itself. That is the hive of the title. There is no protagonist, really, in the hive, but just a series of vignettes, a series of characters, that many of them appear only once. Some of them appear many times, and we re-encounter them as we read the novel. In the prologue to that novel that I was mentioning before, Mrs. Caldwell Habla con su hijo, which, by the way, the prologue to that novel is almost as interesting as the novel itself, uh, Camilo José Sela says that La Colmena is a novel without a hero. He says that all of the characters in this novel, like the snail, they live immersed in their own insignificance. 
So that is very important to keep in mind also, because it really tells you not only what kind of a novel we have, what kind of characters we have, but also what kind of approach on the part of the narrator or the author. Now, I told you there are no protagonists. That said, there are some characters that stand out that is almost inevitable. And I'm going to tell you about them when we look at some of the stories that are included in uh, this novel. Let's look at the structure now, okay? I have this edition by uh, Catedra, which as I always tell you, if you're going to read something in Spanish, if there's a Catedra edition, then make a point of getting this one, because most of the time they are a little bit of an authoritative uh, version or edition of any given text. In my version, this novel has just about 300 pages long. The English version is you know, 260 pages long or something like that. And the story is divided into six chapters. They are varying in, in length and there's also an ending after that. But most importantly, beyond the chapters, beyond the number of pages, what we have here primarily, as I mentioned before, is a series of vignettes. Some of them are three pages long, some of them are only a few lines long, but we have these little pieces, right? So basically, at the end of the day, what you're looking at here is a mosaic of the city of Madrid. And this structure is just exquisite, okay? It just works perfectly for the kind of work that we have here, because, you know, due to that little uh, vignette type of structure, it is really fast-paced. So what it's, it does is that it really mirrors that pace of the city, the rhythm of the urban space and all the people who are living there. It's really like a hive. So that's one of the reasons why we have that title. This novel really is a page turner because of that structure. It's one of the most effective novels that I have re ever read in terms of the structure that the uh, narrator favors. There's a critic uh, by the name of Gonzalo Sovejano and he looked at the chapters that I was telling you about, you know, those six chapters plus that final uh, part, that ending. And he actually assigned a theme to each one of these chapters that I wanted to share with you. So he says that the first chapter deals with humiliation, the second one deals with poverty, then we have boredom, then we have sex, concealment, and finally that ending deals with repetition. This is a very interesting thing, a very interesting approach. I wanted to share it with you because of that, but I also want to say take it with a grain of salt. Okay, it's just something to keep in mind as you read and maybe to ask yourself if this is really uh, the way the novel works. Silla said that The Hive is not really a novel, but a history book. And this is also something that we should take with a grain of salt. I think that's always the case whenever authors speak about their own works. Sometimes you know how it is. You have to be really careful whether you take their word seriously or not. I would say there is no doubt that the novel presents a faithful portrayal of Madrid in the 1940s. I would say this is an objective novel. It is, you know, even a novel that you could describe as realistic, especially if you compare it to the typical 19th century novel with its godlike narrator. But at the same time, you know, you're going to see that you cannot ignore the voice of the narrator here. The narrator is not completely outside of his work in The Hive. So that's one of the reasons why I was saying, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It is a history book in a way, but it is also a novel. Maybe it's one of those both and situations instead of an either or situation. And because of that, you know, I think uh, this would be a good moment to share with you the citation for the Nobel Prize of Camilo José Sela, because yes, he won the Nobel Prize in literature back in the year 1989. And he received the Nobel Prize in Literature, quote, for a rich and intensive prose, which with restrained compassion forms a challenging vision of man's vulnerability. And what I want to highlight here in this citation is the concept of restrained compassion. That's why I was telling you, he is not completely, the narrator is not completely outside of his work, because we do have a sense of compassion here when you listen to the words of the narrator describing these characters. It's not the compassion that you're going to get from Anton Chekhov or from Alice Munro even, but it is a type of restraint, compassion. So that's something also that I wanted to emphasize right here. Let's look at some themes now, okay? And the first thing that uh, we should say is that this novel depicts tough times, okay? There is scarcity, there, is, there are some things, for example, sugar, for example, oil, tobacco, these are luxuries, okay, in this time. We're looking at, once again, one, 1940s Madrid, right? So as a result of that, you can see that money is really a prominent thing. 
okay like who has money who does not have money how much things cost this is a concern that you see in the characters throughout the novel people who are desperate for money people who are desperate to find a job etc besides the money issue we have also the problem of surveillance because you have to keep in mind that this is Spain living under a dictatorship the dictatorship of Francisco Franco so you have to be very careful what you say who you say things to you have to be careful even what you read that is a very important part of one of the episodes that are referred in the hive and then finally you're going to notice that the novel really focuses on the present time both from the perspective of the narrator and also from the perspective of the characters and the things that they discuss and there's a clear reason for this you know once again 1940s madrid you don't want to think about the past okay the civil war it was terrible that's something that you want to leave behind. And the future, well, there's just no clear picture of a future for many of these characters. So that's why everything seems to be concentrated in the present. So what are you going to find in this novel, right? In a nutshell, this is a novel about everyday life. So you're going to find uh, happiness, sadness, joy, hate, love, resentment, sex, all sorts of things. I mean, you name it, it's here. These are the lives of quote-unquote ordinary people. If you've seen other of my videos, you know why I say quote-unquote ordinary people, because really there are no ordinary people. But that's another story. The view that the narrator presents, and I would include Sela here as, a, as an author, you know, not just a narrator, but the author himself, is a rather pessimistic one. But there are moments of hope, you know, there are little rays of, of light, and there are also touches of humor. In other words, there is no lasting happiness but there are moments of respite, and that's what allows these characters to go on. So let me tell you about some of the stories that you're going to find in the novel, because it's a novel made up of so many different stories. And for that, what I wanted to do, I thought that a good approach would be to focus on three characters, and then to mention other important characters that uh, you can see here in this novel. The first character that I wanted to mention is Doña Rosa. One of the reasons why I want to mention her first is because the novel itself actually begins with her. The first line of the novel is actually something that she says, and it's in a way a key to reading the novel. She says, No perdamos la perspectiva. Yo ya estoy harta de decirlo. Es lo único importante. In the English version, you have something like, uh, Let's not lose our sense of proportion. So they do not use the word perspective, but the sense of proportion, right? Which is, it amounts to the same thing when you look at the idiomatic expression here. So Doña Rosa is the owner of a cafe. The cafe is named Las Delicias. She's a very interesting character. She is conservative, she is hypocritical, and she has fascist uh, sympathies. Okay, it's very, very clear. To her, actually, she says that the fate of the Wehrmacht is directly tied, or the way she perceives it, is directly tied to the fate of her cafe. So she is constantly looking at the news, seeing if Germany is going to win or not. Not much happens to her in the story, actually, but she is really important because she is the owner of that cafe where so many of these lives intersect. So that is an aspect that reminded me of Midak Ali by Nagib Mahfouz when I was reading The Hive, because you also have that cafe where uh, so many of the characters meet. The second character, important character, that I wanted to focus on is Martin Marco. He is a poet and he is a penniless intellectual, so he is one of those characters who do not have money. And most of the time when we see him in the novel, you're going to notice that we see him wandering. He's walking around. He's a wanderer, so that tells you there is no sense of a future here, no sense of a direction or a goal or anything like that. He has a sister and a few friends who help him occasionally with money. And throughout the novel, you're going to see him meeting old acquaintances and having conversations with them. He is one of the most philosophical characters in, in the novel. So he has great insight into things. But in this society, that doesn't really allow you to live very well. I would say that uh, if you want to look for a protagonist in, in the hive, let's say you're the kind of reader who needs to have one figure to, to follow and, and to root for. I would say that Martin Marco is probably the closest that we have to a protagonist. And because he is a writer, there are many connections between him and Camilo José Sela himself. Also, you know, very importantly, the novel ends with him. So he appears in the last 
vignette of the hive and actually that ending that final chapter if you will of the novel focuses on him so that would be another way to support this idea of reading the novel and reading Martin Marco as the protagonist of the hive and then we have finally the third character that I wanted to share with you and that is Victorita Okay. Victorita is a very interesting young woman who is in a relationship with a young man who is suffering from tuberculosis. She is just the image of self-sacrifice, taken maybe sometimes to an unhealthy uh, you know, uh, extent. She is really, really willing to sacrifice herself for her boyfriend. So you could say maybe that her love is a misguided version or a misguided concept of love but it is love nevertheless just to give you an example she is willing to sell her body in order to get money so that you know she can help her boyfriend become cured of this illness so you see what i was saying with this idea of love but you know a misguided type of love her mother is constantly telling her you know just leave that guy you know he's contagious and all of that but she is just committed to to this relationship show so that's what i would say you know makes her a very interesting character and there are many more as i was saying before another important character is doña elvira in this part of her life we see her for example suffering from stomach problems at night and having nightmares then we have don celestino who is infatuated with doña elvira we have another couple julita and ventura they are a young couple and there's a very interesting story concerning them these are characters that recur okay the ones that i'm mentioning right now they are the most important characters i would say of the hive not the kind of character that you just see in one of the vignettes and then they disappear because there are many of them also too there's a very interesting gay character if you're you know interested in the portrayal of that lifestyle his name is suarez and actually his mother doña margot is very important because something happens to her in the second chapter i believe if i remember correctly of the novel they are involved in a very important narrative thread of the hive we also have uh, a bar owner okay his name is don celestino actually the guy who is interested in doña elvira i told you don celestino just erase that his name is don leoncio don celestino is the owner of a bar and he reads nietzsche and of course he has to be secretive about this so whenever certain people go into the bar he hides the book so you see what i'm saying we go back to that idea of a society under surveillance and there, there are many minor characters for example the the character that that stands out to me there's a guy who commits suicide because he says it smells of onions right there are no onions or anything but he just cannot get that smell of onions out of his nostrils and and he ends up killing himself because of that there's also a parrot very interesting who has a taste for foul language and one of the other characters at one point uh, says that she's going to um, accuse this parrot so that he can be arrested so back to that idea of surveillance and how ridiculous it can be in many cases so uh, i would say that you realize how magnificent the hive is especially after the second half when you begin to notice how all of these destinies are interwoven so closely in ways that sometimes even the characters do not realize. So let me give you an example. There's one part in which a character goes to the restroom and he finds some money there. Okay, so he finds the money, he goes and spends it on something, and then a few pages later we find out that somebody has lost money and we know that it belonged to him. So you see what I'm saying? It's like everything is closely interwoven in ways that they do not even realize many times. And sometimes what happens is that you may hear about an episode from the perspective of one of the characters. And a few pages later, you get the same episode, sometimes with the same dialogue, but from the other character's perspective. This doesn't happen a lot, you know, but look out for it because it's one of the ways in which we are shown, you know, all of these destinies. It's just a, an amazing crisscrossing of destinies. That's how I would describe the, the hive in that way. This edition that I have, and, you know, many editions include this, others do not, has a senso de personajes at, at the end. So the senses of characters. And they tell you here some things about these characters so that you can recognize them. And the cool thing about this is that they also counted the characters. So according to this, we have 296 fictional characters and exactly 50 historical characters. This reminded me of uh, Georges Perec's novel, Life, a User's Manual, because you also have this, uh, you know, uh, character list or uh, stories that are included in the novel, a list of those so that you can keep track of them. 
I would say the sense of the personajes, I did not really consult it many times, okay? So I want to say it's a really cool thing to have, but it's not absolutely necessary, really. This is not a novel in which you get lost, because we are talking about less than 300 pages, so it's really uh, manageable. Another aspect that I wanted to highlight about the Hive is the use of popular wisdom in the form of proverbs, okay? There are many proverbs throughout the text from the characters and also from the narrator. Just a couple of examples. There is one that says, A rey muerto, rey puesto. So that means as soon as a king dies, another king is placed in the throne. And I think it's always ironic, right? For example, in this case, the narrator was talking about a young woman who was dating a guy who had a certain profession. And then she broke up with that guy and ended up dating another guy who had the same profession. So you see what I mean? As soon as a king dies, another king is put on the throne. There was another one that said, Todos hemos sido cocineros antes que frailes. So we have all been cooks before we were monks. So it's like dealing with experience, right? We know how things in the kitchen work. First we were cooks, we knew everything about that, then we became monks. There's another one, Paciencia y Barajar, which you can also find in Don Quixote, in the second volume of Don Quixote, in a key episode, Don Quixote says this. And I think, you know, uh, Spain is really famous for these proverbs. And you can totally see them, for example, in Don Quixote. Sancho Panza is constantly sharing these proverbs with us, this popular wisdom, many times in the wrong place and completely out of context, but, you know, that is another story. So you can definitely see that in the hype, that aspect of the Spanish speech. And speaking of that, the language that you find in this novel is just truly local, okay? One of the reasons why I like the Catedra editions is because they include footnotes, and there are many Hispanisms in this novel, many Hispanismos. The, the footnotes were really helpful for me when it comes to that, because yes, we speak the same language, I speak Spanish, but I speak Argentine Spanish. Argentine Spanish has also its Argentinismos, and sometimes it's difficult, you know, to, to uh, look at those and, and see what they mean. So the footnotes were really helpful because of that, and also because of the fact that there are many references, local references, that are lost. Let me give you a quick example here. The newspaper that somebody reads tells you a lot about their politics and about their ideas, right? So that would have been lost to me because I have never lived in Spain and of course I don't know what Spain was like in the 1940s. So that's the kind of thing that I like, you know, from uh, editions like this one. The style, okay, a word about the style. I think the, the style here is, is really poetic. Uh, and because I brought up the language, I wanted to share with you a couple of quotes from the novel that show you what I mean by that, po by that poetic style on the part of the narrator. The first one has to do with a really important episode. There's a character named Petrita. She is Martin's sister's maid, okay? And Martin, uh, as I told you before, he doesn't have money, right? So he's constantly owing money to people. In this case, he owes money to a bar owner, Don Celestino. So what Petrita does is that she goes, she, Martin doesn't know anything about this, and she does not know how, he does not know how Petrita feels about him. So she goes to the bar owner and she basically pays off Martin's debts with her body, okay? And after that we have this. It says, Por la trastienda del bar de Celestino Ortiz pasó como un ángel que levantase un huracán con las alas. Then we have some dialogue. And after that, Petrita con las mejillas arreboladas, el pecho palpitante, la voz ronca, el pelo en desorden y los ojos llenos de brillo, tenía una belleza extraña, como de leona recién casada. So you see what I mean? It's really, really poetic. And the other one that I wanted to share with you has to do with an episode that happens towards the end of the novel. So we have La mañana sube poco a poco, trepando como un gusano por los corazones de los hombres y de las mujeres de la ciudad, golpeando casi con mimo sobre los mirares recién despiertos, esos mirares que jamás descubren horizontes nuevos, paisajes nuevos, nuevas decoraciones. La mañana, esa mañana eternamente repetida, Juega un poco, sin embargo, a cambiar la faz de la ciudad. Ese sepulcro, esa cucaña, esa colmena. And of course, there you have the title of the novel. So we have as a central metaphor, once again, the hive. The hive is this place where there's hustle and bustle, of course. There's working done to produce honey. But in this case, you don't find a lot of honey in the city. So the title is really effective and it is really ironic at the same time. There's one thing that I wanted to share with you about this title when we look at this central metaphor of the hive. And it has to do with something completely different 
which is this movie right here, one of my favorite movies ever, by Victor Erice, The Spirit of the Beehive. Highly recommended. It doesn't really have much to do with the novel itself, but it does include that idea of the beehive, right? So based on that, I wanted to share with you the ideas of a critic by the name of Marvin De Lugo. He is talking about the hive, right? About the beehive in this case. And this is what he says. The beehive is, quote, a symbol of a social order which, while superficially unified, is nevertheless marked by a radical isolation of each of its members from one another. That radical isolation, this idea that on the surface there seems to be a unity, but actually there's a lot of distance between these characters. That is definitely something that you see in Camilo José Seda's novel, and that's why I wanted to share that with you. So I promised you a little bit of a confession time. Why is the hive so important to me? Here's my confession. There was a time back in the day when I did not read literature in Spanish. Okay, mea culpa, okay? That's, that's the way it was. I, uh, you have to think, I, I left my country, Argentina, when I was 16, you know, I discovered literature when I started going to college. I, uh, you know, started reading all the great authors. I had just read Ulysses uh, for the first time, I was 19, so you get the picture, what kind of, of time it was for me. So I just did not read. I had that prejudice against literature in Spanish. I was taking that class on a survey of Hispanic literature because I needed to have a second language class, and, and that worked for me. So one day the professor was not going to be there uh, for us and she said I'm going to have a student come here to the classroom and play for you guys a movie titled La Colmena. It's based on a very important novel by the author Camilo José Sela. Okay, so I thought the professor is not going to be here. Nobody's going to find out. I'm just going to skip class. So I went to the library and I decided to spend the class time there reading To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. I love Virginia Woolf, by, by the way. So, here's the problem. I was not the only one who had that great idea. And it turns out that maybe two or three people showed up to class that day. And of course, the professor found out. She was upset, to say the least. But I think I was even more upset with myself. I was like, you know, that was so low. Why did you do that? You just had to show up. You were going to watch a movie, you know? So as a form of penance, and this has been one of the... the best uh, moments of penance that I have had in my entire life, I decided, okay, when the time comes at the end of the semester to write that final research paper, instead of doing it on some short story or some poem just to get it out of the way, Jorge, you are going to read La Colmena and you're going to write an essay on La Colmena. That is exactly what I did. And when I read La Colmena, I was so amazed by it. You know, I, I loved it so much that I decided to start exploring literature in Spanish. I was like, ooh, okay, let me, let me tear up that rule that I had, you know, no literature in Spanish. That um, summer, I got my first copy of 100 Years of Solitude. I also got a copy of On Heroes and Tombs by Ernesto Sabato. And basically the, the rest is history. So uh, that was my experience with La Colmena, and that is one of the reasons why it is so important to me. Other readers may be like, well, it's not really that important it is to me. Many years later, uh, by the way, I got the chance of watching the movie, and it's really good also. Camilo José Sela has a small part in it, and, you know, if you get the chance to watch it, it's by Mario Camus. Really, really good movie adaptation of the novel. So, the bottom line, The Hive is really close to my heart because it was my gateway into literature in Spanish, and I know that not many people read Camilo José Sela, okay? He's one of those authors that uh, generally speaking, you know, I would say that his works uh, may not be for everybody. He was a very complicated person, too. I'm leaving that aside because I am looking at the works here. But I would say that his corpus is just very, very interesting. And The Hive is definitely one of the most important Spanish novels of the 20th century. So this is a novel that I believe that you should check out, especially if you like urban novels. So uh, read it for structure, read it for pace, read it for just a beautiful construction of a collective character. And uh, I don't know, if you do read this novel, I really want to know what you think about it, because as I said before, it's really close to me, and I would like to hear other opinions that maybe do not have that, you know, subjective view of it, because it really was my entrance into the world of literature in Spanish. So do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? Just let me know. Those were my two cents on La Colmena, or The Hive, by Camilo José Cela. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.